everyone. Welcome to episode 38 of The Squad Room. I'm your host, Garrett Tesla. I'm an active duty patrol sergeant in Southern California. The Squad Room, if you haven't listened before, welcome, is about developing, optimizing, and most importantly, maintaining the health and wellness of law enforcement officers around the world, starting with myself. Health and wellness mean a lot of things, and I try to explore it all here. How can we maintain and improve our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health, and our mindfulness? And even as you heard in the last episode with Motor Cop, our financial health. This show is really my journey, my uh, goal of exploration, of self-exploration, of self-awareness, trying to get healthier by evaluating my own life and by reaching out to experts to see what I can learn from them. And today's uh, guest is certainly top among them. Uh, Author of one of my favorite books, uh, Professor, you've seen him on uh, TV, former LAPD officer, uh, Dr. David Klinger. Uh, If you were paying attention at all during all of the Ferguson upheaval, Recently, uh, you probably saw Dr. Klinger on TV. You might have his book, Into the Kill Zone, uh, which is one of the most influential books I can recommend uh, for a supervisor to, to use for briefings, but also for a new officer to use to understand the process of a lethal force encounter. Uh, and frankly, it's, it's a great book for anyone, R- veteran, rookie. Anyway, the way that he did this book is fantastic, and it starts with a very intense story that he's going to retell here. And we talk in this episode about um, uses of force, being in critical incidents, uh, uh, how we might sometimes victimize ourselves or be allow ourselves to be victimized by our own experiences, how to handle these different types of stressors, and where he thinks policing is kind of going to be going over the next uh you know, decade or so. It's a very interesting conversation. It's a great conversation. I was kind I was lucky enough to meet Dr. Klinger in person. Um, and it's, it's funny how it all came about because, um, you know, here he is, he's an expert, um, in officer involved shootings. He's working on his second book on that topic. I'm a fan of his first book. And of all things where I met him was at an officer involved shooting. And, um, it was just one of those happenstance events um, and was able to connect with him there. I'd already read his book many years ago and recognized him from the author photo and then from seeing him on the TV uh, so much over the last couple of years. Very kind to give us a lot of his time and uh, his insight. I think you'll enjoy it. He can provide the insight of an academic, but with the uh, mind frame of a cop. I think he's one of the, one of those guys who really uh, epitomizes the idea that once you're a cop, you're always a cop, at least in mindset. So I'm not going to get much further into it. Uh, I'm going to let him do it. Real quick, want to thank our sponsors for the show, SB Tactical and the iCombat Active Shooter Training System. Um, their active shooter training system is something I've used at my department and I really enjoyed the, the quality of it. It was something that I used long before I started this podcast, long before I knew that they lived and worked down the street from me, long before I knew that they were veteran owned and American made. And long before we sat down and had a cup of coffee and realized that we had a lot of the same goals. So it's a great company, sptactical.com. You can read about my first time using their system at sptactical.com slash blog. And you can uh, find out how my training cadre put on a pretty awesome active shooter event there. And you can also look at their iCombat Pro if you're looking at something that you want to use inside the house to sharpen up your skills. So sbtactical.com. All right, I'm not going to josh around any much uh, more. I want to get to this. This is a great episode. This was a lot of fun to record. Super interesting. Dr. David Klinger, professor at University of Missouri-St. Louis and author of Into the Kill Zone. All right, Dr. David Klinger, uh, Professor of Criminal Justice at University of Missouri St. Louis, thanks for being with us on the Squad Room. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So, um, you are the author of one of my favorite books, in, uh, law enforcement related books, uh, titled "Into the Kill Zone," and we'll get into that uh, here in a second. I'm going to jump right into some questions. Sure. Um, but I, you know, when I, I say this with a lot of my guests, but when I created this podcast um, over a year ago, I wrote out a long list of people that I wanted to have on the show, and your name was on it because of this book. Uh, I read this book as a younger uh, deputy. Uh, I still, well, I'm still young. I'd like to think that I'm still young, but I was younger. Uh, okay. And <laughs> read the book and really liked how not only how it was, um, how you had uh, laid it out and the formula that you used for the book, but the insights that it gained inside. So I, I thought there was a lot to the mental aspects of law enforcement that to be gleaned from that book. And, and your name was on that list of people that I wanted to have on the show. And then Thank around you. the same time, 
you you were because I mentioned you were at the University of Missouri at St. Louis. You you happened to be right there in the epicenter of one of the biggest events in recent law enforcement history, and you were all over the news at the same at that about that same time uh, as as a, uh, a talking head, for lack of I guess a pundit, whatever you want, a consultant, analyst, um, all those different words. Sure. And uh, then in the middle of all that, and your book's about officer-involved shootings particularly, um, or officer, or life-threatening officer events, and we ended up meeting, of all things, very briefly, but at an officer-involved shooting at my agency uh, because you just happened to be you're, – you're good friends with someone in my chain of command, and you just happened to be spending the night uh, visiting with them, and lo and behold, we have this event, and you just kind of tagged along to the whole scene. Right. And it was this funny, surreal moment for me, and I don't expect you to remember this, but uh, you getting out of uh, my command officer's car, and I'm thinking, is that Dr. David Klinger, <laughs> the guy who wrote the book on officer-involved shootings, showing up at this officer-involved shooting? That was a very surreal moment. So it was a pleasure to meet you there. Thanks for coming back. Uh, that's a long-winded uh, description of uh, kind of the background of why I wanted to have you on and, and then how we met real briefly. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so anyway, I'll get to the questions. I'll stop talking. I'll let you talk. But so we, we mentioned this, your book, Into the Kill Zone. Yeah. You're not just a professor of criminal justice. You have a very unique story of how you ended, eventually ended up becoming a professor. And then the unique story of this book. And it seems like this book was sparked by uh, a very personal event for you early in your career as a young LAPD officer. Uh, and that seems like that event really is what culminated in into this book and can you tell us tell me and describe that event that night uh that's maybe maybe i'm wrong but maybe that's what started this whole thing what happened on that night as a young lapd officer yeah let, let me back up a little bit i went sure. to a college up in seattle at seattle pacific uh, university and uh, to make a very long story short um i had an interest in becoming a police officer that antedated going off to college and for whatever reason, was interested in the topic of officer-involved shootings. And so I wrote a couple of papers for two different classes uh, about different aspects of officer-involved shootings. One was some policy-relevant stuff. The other one was the geographic dispersion of officer-involved shootings in the city of Seattle. So I had an honest um, academic uh, mindset about officer-involved shootings before I went to LAPD. And then uh, about four months out of the academy... Um, summer of 1981, we're coming up on uh, 35 years ago. Um, I'm working with a guy named Dennis Azevedo and working South Central Los Angeles, 77th Street Division, which is a very busy area. And I spent the first three months of my probation um, working, um, excuse me, f first four deployment periods, uh, which is just shy of four months, working day watch. And then I got wheeled to, uh, to PM watch, which is basically four to midnight. And uh, the very first night, uh, we uh, responded to a call of a uh, officer needs assistance that was put out by an airship. And lo and behold, as, as myself and a different partner are responding to this first uh, call, for, or one of the first calls of my first shift on PM Watch, uh, shooting goes down uh, inside a house where there were three officers. Uh, and a guy had uh, shot his wife and then shot himself, turned into a SWAT call up. At any rate, I said, holy mackerel, PM watch is different than day watch. <laughs> and then for the next um, couple, three weeks, I was working just regular shifts and getting into the very, very busy uh, pace of South Central Los Angeles. Back then, we would typically handle 30 calls a shift, and they would all be shootings, robberies, rapes in progress, whatever the case might be. And then uh, I, I'm working with a guy named Dennis Azevedo one night. And um, I think it was our first night that we had worked together. And um, we had responded to several calls um, that night. And two of them, I'd never been involved in any, any sort of calls with anybody with a knife. And two of them involved uh, individuals with knives. Uh, and then we got a call of a man with a gun at a particular location. Um, and just as we're clearing that, it turned out to be no good. Just as we're clearing that, we get a call to back up some Southwest Division officers 77th and Southwest Division of Butt uh, in South Central Los Angeles on Vernon. And we were just a few blocks um, west of there, so we, we go screaming up. And a uh, sergeant there, a guy named Bobby Sedios, says, uh, hey, guys, there's nobody on the western edge of the perimeter. That house down the block, uh, guy came home, 
and uh, there's a guy inside that cranked a round off at him, at the homeowner. Homeowner thinks he's locked him in. Typical South Central L.A. house with burglar bars, and the homeowner believed that he had the, the burglar locked in there. So we think we're going to deal with an armed burglar. And so Dennis and I um, scoot over to the uh, western edge of the, uh, of the house. We stop one house away. We have some nice cover. There's a Cadillac that's parked uh, in the drive of, driveway of the house next to the objective. Uh, and also, as we just are about to leave to head that way, we notice, and the sergeant tells us, there's a crowd on the uh, south side of the street. They're all in the kill zone. You need to get them out of there. So as Dennis and I are running down the, uh, the uh, north side of Vernon on the sidewalk, we're yelling at the people on the south side, you know, get out of here. They all realize what's going on. There's a helicopter orbiting overhead. They put two and two together, and they all take off. So they, they get out of there, and Dennis and I, uh, of course, we have our weapons drawn, both pistols out, and uh, looking at the objective, and uh, somehow we noticed that there was a guy across the street uh, among that crowd who hadn't left. And uh, so Dennis decided to uh, extricate the guy. Uh, he, he says, hey, I'm going to go over there and get him out of there. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not a good idea because you're going to get shot at from the guy in the house, and I'm going to have to cap this guy. But, you know, you're the, you're the senior officer. So Dennis takes off, and as I am um, concentrating on windows and doors looking for the suspect to uh, start shooting at Dennis, I hear above the din of the helicopter, get your fucking hands off me, don't tell me what to do. And so I glance over my right shoulder, and Dennis and this guy are talking. Um, can't really tell what's going on. Excuse me, can't hear what's going on because of the, the orbiting helicopter. Um, but I'm watching, and uh, the guy takes a step away as if he is going to walk westbound down the sidewalk. And then Dennis takes a step towards him to grab his, uh, the suspect's right elbow with Dennis's left hand as if to escort him. And the guy quickly reaches across his body. He's got a Nike gym bag on his left arm, reaches into that, and then very quickly pivots and stabs Dennis in the, uh, the chest with this big butcher's knife. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, WTF, uh, what, what in the world is going on? And the very first thing that popped in my mind is the prime minister of Japan just got assassinated. Now, why in the world would anyone think that? <laughs> well, in 1976, when I was in college, a book came out called The Best of Life. And it's really a fascinating um, pictorial history of all the best photographs of Life magazine uh, going back years and years. And one of the most impressionable pictures in there is a, is a photograph uh, of an assassination of a Japanese political figure. Now, it turned out that he wasn't the prime minister. He was someone else. But the thrust that uh, this guy, two-handed thrust of this butcher's knife into Dennis's chest exactly mimicked the stance of this uh, assassin who had just stabbed this political figure. And then I said, well, that's not what happened. I need to get to my partner's side. And so I start running across the street. Um, and, and also before that, for, for just a split second before I started running across the street, um, after, he, uh, after the bad guy stabbed Dennis in the chest, he then pulled the knife back out and then stood face to face with Dennis, you know, three feet away. And for a moment I thought, Maybe there's no knife. Maybe that's a gun, because why else would you hit somebody and then face them? So I'm thinking that could be a gun, and then real quickly he picked it up, and I realized, okay, it's a knife, and then I start running across the street. I thought for a split second, maybe I can shoot this guy from the distance if that's a gun, but I had a real crappy background, and then all of a sudden it's a knife. So anyway, it's very confusing, um, but I figure out it's a knife attack. I start running across the street. By the time I get across the street... Um, the suspect has knocked Dennis flat on his back um, and uh, has now jumped on top of Dennis. And as he's trying to drive the knife to Dennis's throat, Dennis puts his hands up in front of his face and grabs the suspect's wrist. So I get there, and uh, I'm a dumbass rookie, and I listen to the LAPD command staff tell me in the academy, you know, we always want to try to do everything we can to avoid a shooting. So I figure, okay, I got this voice in the back of my, my head. Um, I've got to figure out a way to disarm this guy because Dennis had a hold of his wrists. And um, so I reached in to, uh, and, and I grabbed the guy's wrist, thinking that with four hands on it, we could push him down, control the knife, and get him handcuffed. Um, at any rate, like a hot knife through butter, he pulls away from me. And I think, uh-oh, Dennis says, shoot him. Uh, my, my gun, I had run across the street with my gun in my hand, but I had an old clamshell holster, the kind that 
flaps open, and you got a button to push. When I went to reholster it, it fell to the ground, but I'm figuring my body's between my gun and the suspect. I don't need to worry about my gun. I got to control that knife. But when Dennis says shoot him, I said, yeah, I tried to take the knife away. It didn't work. So I reach over, um, pick up the gun, and as I'm spinning back to the scene, my head snaps before my body completes the turn, and they're back in that exact same posture. Suspect on top of Dennis. Dennis has his arms um, up, but he's you know he doesn't have his elbows locked out. And uh, so I pick out a spot um, about halfway between the suspect's xiphoid process and his left nipple, and I literally thought that, okay, that's a good spot halfway between the nipple and the xiphoid process. So I've got my head there for a split second before the gun comes on, and I don't take a sighted shot. I'm two feet away max and uh, fire one shot, and as soon as I fire the shot, the suspect says, oh, shit, and Dennis is able to lock his elbows out. And so with Dennis able to lock his elbows out, and the suspect obviously got hit because he said, oh, shit, um, I said, okay, I'm going to reach back in with one hand, and so I've got my gun in my right hand, my left hand on the suspect's wrist, and with Dennis and I, we're able to now push the suspect over onto his side, and we lock the, uh, the, the, the knife in the suspect's wrist down on the parkway. This goes down on the grass parkway between the curb line and the, uh, the sidewalk on the uh, south side of Vernon. And um, he continues to struggle, but I've got the, uh, the knife locked down with uh, my hand, uh, and I put either my, I can't remember now, either my left knee or my left foot on top of his wrist as well. So I've got that locked down. Dennis has got the guy by the head. He's pounding his head into the concrete to, um, you know, we're, we're still in the fight over this knife, even though I've right. got it pinned down. And there's four other officers who come running down the street who are on the east side of the perimeter. And um, between the six of us, we get the guy, get the knife out of the guy's hand, uh, get him handcuffed, and two of the four, uh, drag the suspect out of the uh, danger zone into um, an area behind a Cadillac. Are you still with me? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm, get, I'm getting some weird message here. And um, that's basically the end of it. A, a supervisor comes up and says, hey, guys, sit down on the, on, on the curb here. Um, we got to figure out what happened. And I said, we're not sitting anywhere. There's a guy in that house with a gun. Everybody else on the scene had thought, except for Dennis and I, obviously, uh, thought that the guy that we shot was the burglar who had somehow gotten out of the house. And we'd had an altercation with the burglar and had shot the armed burglar. Uh, so at any rate, we run up onto a, a, uh, the porch of the house uh, where the Cadillac was parked. The suspect was drugged behind, stayed there for a couple of minutes. I watched the guy bleed out. The uh, paramedics came over, uh, cut all his clothes off, um, and I watched him die. And then the uh, supervisor said, hey, guys, go back to your squad car. Uh, there's another sergeant there, and then we went back to uh, 77th Station and started the uh, post-shooting interview investigation, all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's That story, you, you tell that story in the book. Um, how long ago did that happen now? Um, it'll be 35 years, July 25th of this year, so we're looking at 34 years, 10 months, and eight days. So we'll round up to 35 years and (laughs) and say, so here's a question for that. One question I have is that, you know, I've been fortunate that I haven't been in such a situation to be involved in an officer involved shooting, but obviously anyone who's listened to the show who's in law enforcement knows is likely to know someone who has, uh, 35 years. I'm curious if you're able to recall that story in such vivid detail because you've told it before and because it is um, something that you retell often. So maybe it stays fresh or is it something that was seared into you that day and that you would not, it's never going to escape you like that. Um, I think it's the latter. I I do think that um, the fact that I have told it dozens of times now testifying in court, um, typically in depositions in court, they don't really want to go through it, but every now and then, Uh, When I'm testifying in court as an expert, I'll I'll, I'll retell it. Um, You know, TV shows, uh, talking to cops, so on and so forth. But um, as I look back on it, um, I have a sister, a little sister named Judy. And um, after the book came out, I was on uh, NPR's Fresh Air. This would have been about a dozen years ago. And I said, hey, I'm going to be on fresh air. It's going to be broadcast, so listen to it. She says, cool. 
And um, she called me after she listened to it and said, that's amazing. I said, what's amazing? She said, that's exactly what you told me on the phone the night that it happened. And I had forgotten, believe it or not, that I had spoken with her because, you know, in the mix of it, you're allowed to make X number of phone calls, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's a combination of the fact that um, it was it was it was so salient. Um, It was a remarkable moment in my life. Um, And then over the years, um, being asked to tell it, deciding on my own, obviously, to write the book to tell it. um, I, I think that the combination of the two has led me to have the clarity that you just spoke of 35 years later. Uh, but interestingly enough, having interviewed um, many, many officers who um, have told the story of their shooting maybe only a few times, or in some cases not at all since the night of a shooting, um, they have very powerful recollections of, of those moments themselves. So. Yeah, and I you, you the way you just told the story is sem- very similar to how the book is set up, too. And that one of the things I liked... Uh, like I said earlier about the structure of the book is is that you, the, Into the Kill Zone for people who haven't read it is really interviews with officers involved in shootings or in lethal force encounters. And you do break up the book to the kind of before, the during, and then the after. Right. And I, what I liked about that was that um, because you're getting little vignettes or little snippets of people, you see the common threads and consistencies in each of them rather than an entire story told you know, chapter to chapter by breaking these up, you interview the same officers in each of the before, during and after, but you, you tell them in, in, in pieces right. because it seems like that's, it, that's important um, because there's a lot of commonalities to the, like I say before, a lot of the commonalities in the during, in the during. And then it's the after where things seem to um, uh, change. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is the, is the reaction to that. And right. So, uh, and I want to get into some specifics of what you've learned uh, about the after, but um, you eventually wrote the book. You eventually, uh, obviously now you're a professor of criminal justice and you decided to pursue um, the scholarly work. What, ma- what caused you to eventually leave law enforcement? You know, that's, that's a decision that I made 30 some years ago and trying to parse out um, exactly why is, is a little bit difficult. As I, as I think about it, I, I think the shooting had something to do with it, um, and it, it had a huge impact on me, and I, I allude to that in the book. I don't go into uh, fine grain detail, but I think the other thing is that I was a shit magnet. Um, I can't remember now if it was exactly seven or exactly eight days before my shooting. Um, I was supposed to work with a guy named Doug Kershaw, and at the last minute, the watch commander switched us out. And Doug and his rookie got involved in a shooting four blocks away from my shooting. So I would have been involved in two shootings in basically a week had I not been spun out from that um, uh, that, that shift with Doug. And then um, I could give you chapter and verse, but I don't want to bore you, but at least 10 situations where if you put 10 officers in and said, here's what happened, would you have shot or not? Um, 75, 80% probably going to be shooting in, in each of these situations. People with guns, pointing guns, um, people reaching for guns, drawing guns. Uh, one time my, my partner is in a fight with a guy for control of a gun. The only reason I didn't shoot him was because the tactical situation was such that I couldn't get in close enough to get a clean shot uh, without endangering my partner's life. Um, so I think having been in a shooting and having been exposed to so many situations where I could have, with no questions asked, legally shot uh, and, and held fire, it's, um, I think that was overwhelming. The other thing is that um, my goal in being a cop in South L.A. was to stop the gang warfare that was going on there, uh, the Crips and the Bloods and so on and so forth. And um, I wasn't able to realize that. I, I realized pretty early on that that was a pipe dream. And then also all the political baloney that goes on in a major police department. And I looked at the cops around me and I looked at the hierarchy and said, do I really want to um, stay doing this? And I decided no. So I'm going to go to up to Seattle and see if I uh, might 
have a better experience being a cop up there. And now I'd always wanted to go back to grad school at some point to teach college after I got done with my career. And originally I was going to be in L.A., promote for about 10 years, lieutenant captain, whatever, go back to school at UCLA, get my Ph.D. and teach after that, you know, a 20 year career in, uh, in law enforcement. And I just said after a year and a half up in Seattle, you know what, I'm going to go back to school full time. And so that's really it is I basically fast forwarded a plan that I already had because my look at the um, way that law enforcement is structured and dealing with all the frustrations and organizational um, angst and so on and so forth, it just wasn't for me. And I've always kept one foot in law enforcement because of the research that I do. Um, and I enjoy that, but I didn't want to do it for a career. It's, yeah, it seems I mean, obviously you still have an affinity for it and yep. a clear passion for it. Um, it it must have been a was it a I mean it sounds like you've always had the plan you said you always had the plan to go teach so it seems to me a lot of people have an identity really tied up in their career in law enforcement and that is a big part of who they are. Um, but now that you're on the outs you're kind of on the outside looking in and you get to see this perspective and, and in the book and in all of your other work you've been able to interview. I'm guess at least hundreds of cops at this point, and you have a good sense three hundred a good sense of kind of the national scope of of attitudes and beliefs. This is kind of a big question. It's probably a very poorly worded question, but in writing the book and in your research, what what have you learned? Maybe just the general. Uh, I don't want to rephrase that because it's a horrible question, but I guess um, in the sense of of, of officer involved shootings, because that's really mm-hmm. what I wanted to talk to you about in, in lethal force. Um. What are the commonalities, maybe the threads, or what are the things that you have found uh, helped an officer be successful in preparing for one of these events uh, before it happens? Does that make sense? So, so if yeah. you've, if you've talked to an officer who seems to have dealt with it correctly, handled it correctly, what are some of the things that you've been able to find them do prior to the event? I, I think the, the biggest thing is that one never knows how one is going to respond. Um, I thought that I was fully prepared. I had thought through um, intellectually what a shooting would be like and um, how I would respond. I had a deep seat of religious faith, and I had already made peace with the possibility. And um, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And religious faith cuts two ways. For some officers that I've interviewed, it's like I would only do what— is permitted under the law and under God's law, so I'm square. Other officers, um, no matter how much they um, have reconciled themselves like me intellectually to it, uh, religious faith can cut the other way because thou shalt not kill. And so religious faith is is one thing that um, we cannot predict how an individual's faith is going to affect how they respond. I think another thing is um, the sort of assignment one is involved in. Um, I interviewed a disproportionate number of SWAT officers because um, I have affiliations with SWAT uh, organizations around the country. And um, those guys and gals generally um, tend to have a, a different perspective on events And when they are involved in shootings during SWAT operations, it's much more of a group dynamic as opposed to uh, a sole officer. And so I think that SWAT, in terms of the social context, makes a difference. Now, that raises the interesting question of, is there something about cops who are going to be SWAT officers that they're unique or they are somehow different from other officers? And interestingly enough, SWAT officers don't really have much difference in terms of their Um, reactions when we look at officers who get involved in shootings that are non-SWAT related, uh, even though they've got a SWAT background or wish to be on a SWAT team. So this notion of self-selection doesn't appear to really uh, ring true. I think another thing is the nature of the shooting. And what I mean by that is um, not all the time, um, and I I, I take myself as sort of a, a prime example I would argue that my shooting was about as clean as they come. Uh, No doubt about it, this guy is trying to murder my partner. And he was on the the nub of success. The only reason Dennis is still alive is because he wore body armor. He would be dead um, for sure. And in fact, Dennis told me he thought he was dead. 
um, and that he just wanted to make sure that this guy got taken out before Dennis wanted to make sure the suspect right. was taken out before Dennis passed away. Wow. Um, so this was this was one where no questions asked, um, but still it can have an impact on on officers. And so similarly, other officers whose shootings are, um, you know, if it's on video, everyone would say, yeah, need to shoot that guy or, or the vast majority of people. Right. There's always some lunatics out there that think you can, you know, why didn't you negotiate whatever the case might be? But um, when officers are involved in um, – less than clear-cut shootings. Um, suspect has a firearm that turns out to be a replica. Um, suspect has a glue gun. Uh, interview officers who, who shot somebody with a glue gun, so on and so forth. That is something that for at least some officers, it bugs them. Because the moment when you make the decision, you believe that, or th they believed that life was in imminent jeopardy, but it turns out it wasn't. And so consequently, they don't react emotionally and psychologically to the moment that they were in based upon their belief. They take the full 2020 hindsight that, you know, Graham B. Connor says you don't do when you're trying to assess constitutionality. Cops still look at it and say, I should have, I could have mm -hmm. uh, avoided this. So um, I, I think those are those are at least some of the things um, Support, now, in the aftermath, um, you asked about how do you prepare for it. I, I think the, the, the larger picture is in the aftermath. How, how do the peers and others respond? Um, when officers get dragged through the mud through, with, with the press, they don't like it. When the administration doesn't support, they don't like it. When peers give them a hard time, they don't like it. Um, it's harder when familial support is lacking. Um, so I think the, 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 the social context in the aftermath is as important, at least, if not more important, than um, the individual's preparation going in. Um, I can guarantee you that no matter how many possible scenarios that you've run through your mind about how you could be involved in a shooting— you could get involved in a shooting tonight or tomorrow, your next shift, and it will be it will be a scenario that you haven't thought about. Sure. Um, so no matter how well prepared you are, um, you may well find yourself in a uh, in a one off. So, yeah, absolutely. So in the aftermath, what um, what are some things you see either successful officers doing or successful departments doing? One example, I, I mean, we just had a shooting um, on my department a couple uh, weeks ago, seven officers and it was exactly one of those scenarios. Like I had never thought this of this scenario. It was a kidnapping suspect, now now likely a murder suspect. High, high speed pursuit, crash into a neighborhood. He takes over, runs into a house, and shoots out the windows and climbs into the house and takes over the house and then steals a car and tries to get away. Uh, I, I I've thought of each one of those things individually, or maybe a combination, but never that particular combination in that particular. Right. It's crazy. So, you know. And seven shooting officers, that's huge. We've recently instituted a peer support program or a peer-to-peer -peer -peer support. What are some of the things that you think uh, an individual officer can do or a department can do in the aftermath that are, are kind of simple to implement? Because sometimes I think a challenge is if you haven't if you haven't been in it, you're not sure what to say. You're not sure how, what line to cross. I remember sitting with a partner, um, similar to the story you told, uh, after a shooting where he – uh, you know, I was with him when I saw his and I saw his face when he realized the suspect he'd shot has has now passed away mm -hmm. and that change in his face. It gets awkward. It gets really awkward, you know, and, and the the tendency, especially with cops, is to shut down and to not offer that assistance. But what are the things we can do as good partners? We want to be a good partner to reach out to that officer who's just been through that. I think the main thing is tabla rasa. And what I mean by that is don't put anything from your thoughts, your experiences, your perceptions on the moment. Let the officer express. Um, let the officer share whenever he or she is ready, whatever he or she wants to share. Now, I'm not talking about the investigation. They've got to talk to the, um, the investigators if, in fact, they decide to give a statement. I'm talking about directly to your, your question of, of the peer support. Mm -hmm. um, don't assume that the officer is going to be okay. 
Don't assume that he's going to be uh, in, a, in a bad state. Don't assume anything. We, we don't know how this particular officer that you are um, dealing with as a support officer is going to react. And he might have been involved or she might have been involved in a previous shooting and have a very different reaction to this one than they had to the previous one. Um, and that was an interesting thing is I did have the opportunity to, uh, to interview some officers about multiple shootings. And for some officers, they had different reactions to different shootings. Um, and um, I was just reviewing a, uh, a, an interview that I did with an officer on the East Coast. And uh, he killed a guy. And he needed to kill the guy. The guy had shot his partner. This, this suspect needed to be put down. He puts the suspect down. It turns out the suspect ends up dying. And he was uh, reflecting on how he didn't like it that he, won a me- he, that he was given a medal. He was fated by the Fraternal Order of Police, given a medal, this, that, and the other thing. You know, people are slapping him on the back, this, that, and the other thing. That's the last thing that this particular officer needed. Um, so let the officer dictate. And you, you said that officers don't know what to say. To, to me, the best thing that an officer can say is, I'm here for you. What do you need me to do? Do you want to talk about it? You want to keep quiet? Whatever the case, whatever that officer wants, that's what you run with. Um, an officer might not want to talk to you in the moment. Um, reflecting back on the the OIS that that I responded to, uh, my recollection is the the officers were at the, the the shooters were at the substation. One of the officers might have wanted to talk to someone. Another officer might have wanted to keep his mouth shut. The officer who talked at the moment might might not want to talk about it ever again. The other officer might need a week to decompress, and then he's going to want to talk or she's going to want to talk, right? Mm-hmm. And so I say let the officer uh, dictate the information that he or she wants to give and simply show support. I'm here for you. What do you need? Okay. And then for the officer uh- – we touched on a little bit, but the officer who's in this crisis or in this event, this critical incident. Um, and real, real quick, I sure. want to jump in on something. Yeah. And this is one of the, uh, it, it's a little bit more than a nit, but I like to pick it with people. This notion of critical incident, you said officer in crisis. Um, many officers, there is no crisis. It's not a critical incident. Someone was doing something to uh, raise their, um, the, the officers in the officer's mind, I need to shoot this person. They do that. That is their job. And I've talked to, as I say, hundreds of officers. And for some of them, they, it's not a crisis at all. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, put down a, a, uh, there's an active shooter in Houston over the weekend. I don't know if you heard about it. He's not a good friend of mine. I haven't spoken with him about it, but I've spoken with two of my buddies about it. And this guy had murdered somebody. He shot nine or ten other people. He shot a couple of officers. Yeah. And um, this officer's a marksman. He put the put the suspect down. That's it. That's his job. And I've spoken with him about other shootings he's been involved in. And his attitude is, why should it be looked at as a quote unquote critical incident? This person was trying to murder some police officers. I shot him before he could. That is my job. Um, and so there's something called self-fulfilling prophecy. And if what we do is we plan in the minds of police officers that you're going to have a problem in the wake of a shooting, then it actually increases the likelihood that they're going to have some problems. And one of the things that I went through and many of the officers that I interviewed uh, for, for Kill Zone went through is this. In the wake of the shooting, you're sitting there thinking about it and you realize you don't feel bad that you killed somebody. But all your training said, you know, if you get involved in the shooting, it's a crisis, it's a critical incident, this, that, and the other thing. And then you say, man, I must be some kind of god-awful human being because I don't feel bad about this. So you start to feel guilty about not feeling guilty. And that's a phrase that multiple officers uh, used as, I was, as, as they were talking with me as we were, as we were chatting about the, uh, the event, mm-hmm. that um, this self-fulfilling prophecy can actually be negative. And we... We sort of see it in the in the media about guys and gals coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and various and sundry other theaters. Oh, PTSD, they're going to be this, they're going to be that. Maybe. it's. I've never been to combat, thank God. Um, I don't know what it looks like, but I've got very good friends that have. And some of them, it's like, 
it was it was not pleasant. I don't want to go back, but it's part of my life, and they move on. Others are rocked by it. So um, we have to understand that there's a distribution of how people respond to being involved in highly violent encounters, mm -hmm. um, but it's not always a quote-unquote critical incident from the perspective of um, mental health. Uh, one thing that's really interesting is we know that the roles that people inhabit uh, have an awful lot to do with how they respond to things. And I've got a neighbor across the street, a good friend of mine, her boyfriend's a vascular surgeon. And when he and I have talked about his job, he's dealing with death all the time. He's dealing with surgeries that nobody could have saved anybody's life, but he, he did his best. That's his job. Um, it's not easy, but it doesn't take the toll on him that it might take on all sorts of other people who would walk into an operating theater and see dead bodies and, or see blood all over the place and a dead body. Right. Similarly, when I was a young police officer, um, dealing with gore never bothered me. Dead bodies didn't bother me. The emotional pain that the people who loved the dead people, um, that their pain affected me, but seeing gruesome scenes never bothered me until I'd left police work and I'm doing ride-alongs and now I'm seeing this carnage again, but I was no longer a cop, so it wasn't my role. And then I started getting a little bit, man, that's really gross. So social roles have an awful lot to do with how people are going to respond um, to carnage, for lack of a better term. And I know I'm rambling on a little bit here, but at any rate, I think that we could do a better job uh, of supporting officers without trying to put a label and saying our expectation is you're going to have a problem. The expectation should be here's a distribution of how human beings are going to respond. Some officers are going to be just fine. Other officers are going to have a difficult time. And that's why I advise let the officer set the pace for things and always be there to support. That's um, a fascinating idea, and it makes total sense. Um, I talk to a lot of uh, veterans, military uh, people on the show, and then just in my regular life. And one thing that's been coming up a lot more and more, um, particularly with this book I just started, uh, Tribe by Sebastian Younger, is this idea a that great author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this new book, I'm excited. Be in the concept of this, there's a lot of concepts in this book, but one of them, and it's a theme I've heard several times, and I've heard face to faces from veterans, is that I, I, I've I've done my service and I serve my country. Don't when I get home, don't treat me as a victim. Right. And we have this tendency, uh, again, you're, you're talking about societal roles, so this is interesting, and I'm talking as I think this through myself, but a veteran comes home, they've done their job, they've done their role, they did, the, they did it proudly, and then those of us who haven't done it and who haven't been in that role and can't wrap our head around the thing they just went through have a tendency to want to treat them as a victim of something they went through that's horrific. Right. And it seems that I've, you know, there's other authors uh, who Eric Greitens has spoken on this too, um, uh, also a professor at the University of Missouri, um, who uh, that when they when they come home they're not damaged goods, so uh, necessarily, um, and that we tend to put this label on them. So I, I like this idea that we can't do the same thing. We should not be doing the same thing for cops. That makes perfect sense. It makes sense when you put it in terms of like gore and bodies. I have the same kind of. It's my job. I I, I don't have that. It doesn't have that effect on me. Um, but what should um, I mean, that's, that's kind of a big shift. A, mm -hmm. That's a big shift. And, and I, mean, I guess it's, it starts with um, people, uh, a big part of it is your research and that research trickling down. Uh, and that's, um, I guess, something I'd like to get into, too, is, is sure. you're now in a unique position of having really done the job that you're now teaching about. And you're doing it somewhere, like I mentioned before. I mean, St. Louis, Ferguson... Uh, which is its own word now. I mean, it's like right. a it's a noun and everything and verb and everything else um, is is a suburb of St. Louis. Right. So you are in the epicenter of one of the biggest events in recent history. Um, so I think you have a unique perspective there in terms of being there, done that, and then this, and then you've been pulled in. I mean, you've been on lots of different shows uh, offering your opinion, but um, I have some questions about how you teach or, or what you're teaching now, and if the if the if the content content the um the attendance the, the people who are attending your classes now are they still people who want to be cops or are they people who want to be uh these social warriors or is it a mix of both now 
Um, and uh, I have I have a couple other questions, I guess, about that. Sure. Are you mean my undergraduate students? You're, yeah. Or undergrad students, um, you know, they're eighteen to twenty, whatever years old, and typically they're not quite sure what they want to do. Some of them want to be cops. Some of them want to be lawyers. They want to. Uh, work as a district attorney's investigator. They want to be a profiler. You know, that drives me nuts because there's no such job, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so I have to disabuse them of the notion. Um, but but my students don't, um, we're, we're not a cop shop, so we're not training people necessarily to become police officers, but maybe 10% of them Interesting. Um, want, want to be police officers and we'll, we'll have sidebar conversations. But most of what I teach really isn't related to my research per se. Okay. So when you um, when you talk to people or when people recognize you from TV or, or see you right. as in the role as a former cop, and, and certainly the fact that you're a professor now gives you some heady weight to um, your expertise and your words, what are some of the things that you seem to often, you say, I use your own term, you just use disabuse the public of their misperceptions about police? I think the biggest thing, and... Um I think this is the most important chapter in Kill Zone. It's chapter three. It's situations where officers could have shot and didn't. You know, I, I <clears throat> threw out that I was involved in a very disproportionate number of circumstances where I could have legally shot people, no questions asked. But the third chapter is all about situations where officers hold fire. And uh, probably the best um, set of stories, or, 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 or definitely the best single story in my mind, a good friend of mine, his name is Sandy Wall. Um, we were friends before uh, he agreed to be interviewed, and we've been friends since. I spoke to him earlier this week. At any rate, he's the guy who's the busy cop in Kill Zone. And he tells a story about standing there um, on a, a dope raid with a woman holding a gun pointed at him. And clearly he has lawful warrant to shoot this woman, but there is something about the way that she was holding the gun where he said she doesn't know how to pull the trigger. And so he waits, and he's trying to figure out, do I really need to kill this woman? I, I know if I start shooting, she is dead. Um, he's close enough. He's an expert shot, so on and so forth. But he opts to hold fire, and she eventually drops the gun. And in fact, she didn't know how to shoot the gun. She was terrified, and she just picked up the gun. Uh, I think it was her you know, dopehead boyfriend's gun, something like that. At any rate, story after story after story. And so... Um, what I did in my uh, both of my studies, the one that led to Kill Zone and the one that I'm starting to spool up for my second book, I ask officers who've been involved in shootings, how many times were you involved in situations where you could have shot but you held fire? And um, the vast, vast majority, 70, 80, 90 percent, I couldn't tell you right now, of officers who've been involved in a shooting could have been involved in additional shootings. I also interviewed about 50 cops who, who were witness officers. So you and I are on patrol and something happens and I dump a guy and you choose for whatever reason not to, then you're a witness officer, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, they could have been involved in, in shootings. They could have shot, not just in that situation, but in others. I think the biggest thing that we need to get people who don't know anything about law enforcement and therefore people who wish to become police officers down the line is to understand that cops don't want to shoot people. If police officers really wanted to shoot people, um, the, the best figure we have from the Washington Post uh, and the Guardian databases, um, newspapers uh, did searches, and they figured that in 2015, uh, U.S. cops killed about 1,000 people. We don't know how many times they shot and missed, don't know how many people they wounded, but about killed about 1,000 people with gunfire. Um, I would venture to argue that easily, if police officers shot each and every time they had lawful warrant to shoot, that number would be five times higher. Um, I don't know what your experience is, but uh, if you spend time talking with cops, um, they could have shot in many situations where they, they, they decided not to. And so I think that's the, the, uh, the biggest untold story that, that people need to understand is cops don't want to shoot people. Um, I think another thing is the notion of racial bias. Um, it drives me nuts when these people go into laboratories and come up with some, it, the, the experimental designs are brilliant. And the people that have run the button pushing experiments I'm gonna talk about in a second are really sharp social psychologists and they do really good research. The problem is that putting someone in front of a computer screen and 
telling them, if you see a gun in someone's hand, push a button that says shoot. And if you see something in their hand other than a gun, push don't shoot. That is so far removed from what goes on in the field that it just drives me nuts. But people say, look, these people in experiments, they're more uh, rapidly pushing the button to shoot the black guy, and they more often shoot the black guy who's holding a cell phone than they do the white guy with the cell phone. That drives me nuts. What I know from my own experience working in the South End in Los Angeles in the early 1980s and talking with hundreds and hundreds of cops is the last person that a white police officer wants to shoot is a young black male. Period, paragraph, end of story. We have idiots like this Van Dyke guy out in Chicago who blew a fuse and shot Laquan McDonald. These things happen. But the average police officer um, is not out there to shoot anybody, particularly a young black male. And so the, the, the issue of racial bias as a motivating factor in police decisions to use deadly force drives me crazy. That's uh, obviously a big one. I think the one I come across the most, and maybe it's just because people maybe know me a little bit closer, but the ones I interact with, it's uh, that we all didn't just come out of SEAL Team 6 with <laughs> you know, a, you a, a triple black belt in every martial art right. and uh, knowledge of every hand-to-hand combat and marksmanship and all those things. And it's like right. we, are, we are experts only in the sense that we have more training than the average person. And right. that shocks people sometimes that we – uh, we have to spend so much of our own personal time doing these things just to stay proficient, much less, right. uh, you know, uh, competent and, and everything else. But I appreciate that. So another question, I don't know if this is within your research or not, but learning a lot through this show, through our listeners in New Zealand and Canada and um, Australia, those three specifically, that the United States is very far behind in how it treats officers as, in, in, as the human um, mm-hmm. and in terms of, um, health programs in terms of, uh, you know, being aware of PTSD and, and, and those sorts of things. And in, in fact, I got sent a photo of some Canadian cops doing meditation in full kit, like a whole squad, like 30 cops, full gear doing meditation, um, up in Canada. And, um, I'm curious if you have any perspective of what, um, maybe the U S could be doing better versus some of these other countries. I honestly don't know. The only thing that came to my mind as you were talking about the meditation is um, I'm a huge fan of Japanese samurai film. And uh, these warriors are very calm, peaceful people until they pull their sword out and start chopping people to shreds. And so um, while I do understand the notion of meditation and I do understand the notion of um centering and, and all that sort of stuff. I've got friends that practice mar- martial arts, uh, Aikido, whatever the case might be. Um, I don't know how that fits with something that you raised earlier on, and that is the notion of you know the warrior mindset versus the protector, um, so on and so forth. Um, I think the simple answer is I don't know enough to know whether – That's good stuff, bad stuff, or indifferent stuff. What I can tell you is the threat environment that they operate in is completely different than the threat environment that the average American law enforcement officer um, works in. Um, You look at officers, uh, the Lyoka data, law enforcement officers killed and assaulted uh, in the FBI, um, and how many officers are murdered every year. Um, how many officers are assaulted and seriously injured and survive, or like Dennis Acevedo, um, assaulted and saved by body armor uh, versus what's going on in these other places. Um, Who knows? Uh, That's a long-winded way of saying the professor doesn't have any good (laughs) data to uh, make any any intelligent statement other than just the little homily he just went off on. Well, you you do talk a little bit about mindfulness and policing, and we talk about mindfulness on the show, but what do you, from the point of physical health but what do you mean right. in the context of of policing when you say when you talk about mindfulness when i talk about mindfulness i'm talking about it organizationally and um I, my, my phd is in sociology and while i understand um psychology from a um a research perspective because of social psychology courses i've taken and i read some some psych literature obviously with uh, some of the work that i do um i'm much more interested um, in how organizations operate 
and how it is that small groups in particular um, can do things better. And so when I talk about mindfulness, I'm coming from an organizational perspective, um, something called high reliability theory. And high reliability theory is a strain of um, inquiry in uh, organizational sociology that was basically uh, brought into being uh, by some folks who are really steeped in social psychology, talking about how it is that people interpret what goes on in their environment. And the environment of interest is the organization. So how is it that we can develop ways of um, performing better in high-risk environments? And policing is is a high-risk environment. And what high reliability theory suggests is that being mindful as individuals and as members of organizations to the environment that you're working in can enhance the ability of organizations and organizational actors to perform at a high level. So if we think about a situation where um, you mentioned that you guys recently had an officer-involved shooting where someone took over a house, and I don't know all the details, But I would suggest from a mindfulness perspective that if you took seven police officers who had never worked together, who hadn't trained together, who weren't on the same page, the odds of success in that operation of having um, no civilian casualties and having no innocent officer casualties would be substantially lower than if you had seven guys who were just responding from a SWAT training day. So why is it that that, that SWAT teams are better? Is it because they are these SEAL Team 6 guys who can kung fu you to death? No. SWAT cops are regular cops who happen to be go through a selection process, so on and so forth. But they're trained to work together. And they build into their practice certain tenets of mindfulness. There's a sense of resiliency that if one thing goes wrong, we have a backup plan. So you're not surprised when it turns out that there's a second shooter. It's not just one shooter. Or the suspect is just one, but he's got two guns instead of one gun whatever the case might be, because you practice for these things. So for me, mindfulness is more of a, of a property of an organization. And it can go all the way up from the uh, patrol squads up to how the entire, in your case, sheriff's department operates. It can be how the aviation unit operates, how the SWAT team operates, how the Marine unit operates. But what it has to do with is building into the everyday operations of your organization Um, being mindful of what the issues that you may face are, being prepared to deal with those um, eventualities. And so when they come, you're not surprised. And part of that, part of your theory too, is, is what you call it a preoccupation with failure. Right. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? Sure. Preoccupation with failure is basically the notion that it's very easy to pat yourself on the back and say how good you did or how well things turned out. And if you're preoccupied with your successes, you develop a sense of complacency. You're not mindful. You're not thinking about things. So the example I like to give is traffic stops. We all know that if you handle traffic stops in a very cavalier, very casual fashion, 99.9% of the time, you're going to be fine. And when I'm training cops, one of the things I say is in most cases, you could actually walk up to the violator Say, you know, excuse me, my back's kind of sore today, and it's because I got this heavy belt on. Could you hold my gun belt while I go back and write you a ticket? And the person would be shocked, but they wouldn't pull the gun out and shoot you. The problem is that because officers know that the vast majority of times traffic stops are going to go well, um, you develop a mindset that says everything's fine. Then that one time out of 10,000 or whatever it might be that you're dealing with someone who is not a kind human being, You find yourself like those two poor uh, motor officers in Oakland several years ago who never going to write this guy a ticket. He's a real bad actor. And now we got two dead cops. Not to blame them, but an organizational environment that focuses on success. It's easy to say, yeah, I succeeded. It's not that you succeeded. It's that the person you were dealing with turned out not to be an asshole. Pardon my French. Preoccupation with failure is looking at every single thing you do and saying, What did I do wrong? I don't care who you are. You've never handled anything perfectly. 
So what can I look at to improve? And so being preoccupied with failure means that you as an individual actor and you as a member of an organization and everyone else in that organization and therefore all organizational actors say, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? So you handle a family dispute. Did you park your vehicle in the appropriate place? Was that the best place that you could have parked to make that approach? Did you wait long enough to listen to get those those uh, audio cues that you might um, pick up as you're walking up? Did you communicate properly with your backup? All those little things that we know can make a difference, which 99% of the time aren't going to matter. But in that 1% of the time when it does matter, you are able to prevail because you have been preoccupied with failure. You know, it's that's a point that I really took from the book. I took it to heart when I read it, and it made sense. And I think that... Um we use it we use it well for me when i got promoted now i'm you know i'm a sergeant i'm in charge of other people the real challenge with this which totally makes sense and and, and it's absolutely correct but in leading people when you have a preoccupation with failure is walking that line between continuing to lead and motivate and teach without sounding doomsday-ish and re- without really drawing down morale that's a that's a balancing act that has to happen <laughs> that's right. hard to walk um, I think that 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 is a skill and that is, you know, you use the term leadership or you use the term being a leader. And that is what you you have to engage in leadership effectively. And it's not walking up and saying, hey, dumbass, you did this wrong. It's let's talk about this. How did this go down? Have an honest discussion about what went right, what went wrong, point things out calmly. And what I found is talking with guys, particularly in the military, Um, there can be some brutal debriefs and people can get on each other's asses. Um, But you can't get to that point until people have built it, until you have inculcated a culture of trust that you know, excuse me, that they know that you're not out to burn them, that you're not there to denigrate them, but to make them better. Um, And that's what skillful leadership is all about. Some people don't possess it. And that's why a lot of people in American law enforcement shouldn't be supervisors, shouldn't be lieutenants, shouldn't be captains, because they don't know how to lead. They're managers. We don't need managers in law enforcement. We need leaders. Well, I think, too, that another – I think I was, um, again, going to your book, this idea of deference to expertise and and, and implementing that in in concert with – this preoccupation of, with failure really helps balance that out because, and to, to really uh, sum it up, it's, it's a, it's an, you need to go to where the expertise is. So I am obviously not, I am not a swap cop. I am not a dope cop. I'm not a canine officer. I have those people I can call upon and I have those people with those talents on my squad. It seems that when I'm able to defer to their expertise on other things, it, it does keep, uh, me as a leader from looking like I'm just out harping and harping and harping and I'm 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 trying to engage in a conversation where I know that I'm not also I also am not the best any even on any given day I'm not the best safety wise but also not the best like I say dope cop I'm not the best tactics cop because I got a guy for that mm-hmm. there's often an erroneous assumption that this expertise lies in rank or lies in a command right. staff um what are some things uh, – this is a this is just a jealous personal question. Not jealous, but it's a personal question because it's my show and I get to ask it. But what okay. <laughs> what are some things that first-line supervisors can do in these situations to defer to expertise and to help command see that maybe they need to defer to expertise uh, at a lower rank? I think you're talking down the chain and up the chain. And um, up the chain is not your problem. Um, it is the sheriff's problem, the undersheriff's problem, the commander's problem, the captain's problems, the chief's problem, whatever type of law enforcement organization one might um, be involved in, they need to get educated about these these principles. They need to get educated about these precepts. Um, In terms of um, below you, I think the key is to explain to your charges, here's the five elements of mindfulness that are going to lead to high reliability better performance, and here's why we're doing them. Educate them about it. Um, I really don't think that there's going to be a whole lot of people that are are, going to say, oh, no, that's not important. Now, there are going to be some guys and gals who, you know, super mega disco, we call them Chester Digmies. Hey, look at me. You know, I graduated the academy, and I've been on the road for three years, and I know everything about everything. 
that's your job to manage those the, those egos. Right. Um, but I I just believe as an educator that if they're good enough to have been hired by your organization, they can probably grasp these basic concepts, uh, the, the five basic principles of, of mindfulness, and then you can build a squad that's good. And you're going to have to have some interaction, I'm assuming, with your lieutenant. Um, and so you can explain to your lieutenant about, here's how I'm running the show, here's why I'm doing it, and hopefully he or she is switched on enough to go, oh, his squad is doing great. This makes sense. Um, and then perhaps it can propagate above. Um, so my argument is down below you educate, and then above you model. And hopefully there are people in your organization that are smart enough to go, huh, this this makes some sense. Let's see if we can't get this to be part of our organization more completely. Why is it that we just have one squad that's doing well? And then the other thing, of course, is laterally. You get to work with these other supervisors. And hopefully, because you guys are peers, uh, you can talk to the, the guys and gals that are the other supervisors in your organization and explain to them why you're doing what you're doing and organically, hopefully, things will improve. Um, I'm not a Pollyanna type of guy. I don't think that it's going to be magic. But if you don't do that stuff, then there's no hope. Sure. So last question, and I'll, I'll uh, close up here. Um, sure. want to shift gears a little bit. You, so, again, kind of that 30,000-foot uh, view that you now have of having right. been on the ground and now um, researching all the research you do, where do you see American law enforcement in the next five or 10 years, what are the major things that you think are going to take place to, to um, that either, either threats or opportunities that are going to poten- potentially change law enforcement uh, in, in that time frame? It's real fascinating to, to ponder that because we don't know what the macro political situation is going to be at the national level. Um, but what we've seen in the last 20 or so years, 22 years since the 94 crime bill, is greater and greater encroachment of um, federal oversight in local law enforcement. And that brings with it um, some good stuff, but also a whole host of challenges and problems. And so if the federal government continues to seek more power over the everyday law enforcement operations of local communities, I think we're going to see some um, some fractious discussion, shall we put it. Uh, I think when the Police Executive Research Forum came up with their ill-advised 30 principles, um, that was a shot across the bow of local law enforcement. And I personally think straight from the um, Civil Rights Division and others in D.C. that Chuck Wexler and his crew there um, are very, very tight with. Chuck Wexler is the president of the uh, Police Executive Research Forum. And um, there's, a, there's an undercurrent, a cross-current, something else that's going on where um, more and more people want less and less federal government control. In uh, higher education, the feds have gone crazy with Title IX and claims of sexual uh, impropriety. Don't want to get into that, but some of your readers might want to take a look at some of the stuff where due process has been thrown out the window. So if the feds can throw due process out the window when it comes to claims of sexual impropriety in college, who's to say that they won't take some other law and basically take away due process to police officers who have been accused of things that uh, are untoward? So I I think the role of the federal government is going to be a big one, and that's going to, we don't know how it's going to shake out. Um, I think that there's going to continue to be community agitation. I think that um, how law enforcement deals with protest actions, I I think we've had some miserable failures in your state in terms of um, some protests against Trump's uh, supporters. There was uh, some really bad stuff up in uh, San Jose that went on. Last time I checked, the Constitution protects everybody equally and everybody has the same First Amendment right. Last time I checked, um, the equal protection of law means that if you're a, a, a dirtbag um, asshole who just shot somebody, uh, nobody is allowed to kick your ass, and that's correct. Um, but if you are exercising your First Amendment rights, apparently some people feel 
that it's okay to use violence to, to shut you down. Um, so I think that's going to be something that law enforcement is going to have to deal with. And the cops always, you know, the old notion of it rolls downhill and the cops are at the bottom. And um, we saw what happened across the street in Ferguson. Um, we see what's going on with other mass political violence. And I think that law enforcement is going to have to figure out new ways of dealing with some of these challenges in terms of political um violence or, or potential political violence. And so I, I think federal oversight, federal encroachment on local law enforcement and how law enforcement is going to respond to um, mass um, protests, we'll leave it at that, are problematic. And I think, unfortunately, race is going to be perennial. Um, we're going to have to continue to um, figure out ways to communicate across the racial divide about um what law enforcement's role is, what it should be, what it can be. Um, the notion of the Ferguson effect in terms of cops withdrawing from certain communities and crime going off the, uh, the, the charts is something that's very real, and we're going to have to get a handle on that as well. So that's three. <laughs> Dr. David Klinger, thank you so much for a great conversation. Into the Kill Zone is your first book. Uh, we'll put the links in the show notes for people to follow to get that on Amazon. I highly recommend it. It's a book that I've uh, used in my briefings. I read portions of it uh, along with videos that we show to kind of match things up. I think it's a great insight uh, into that whole process of, of a lethal force encounter. You mentioned a second book. Real, you kind of blew by it, but when can we expect that one out? I'm hoping next year I'll get it. Uh, I'll get it done. I interviewed 80 cops for uh, Kill Zone and 218 cops for the second one. The second one is going to be much more academic, pinhead oriented. So I don't know that it'll be uh, of that much interest. But we'll see. Well, I've always appreciated your insight, your book. Uh, whenever you're on TV, I pause and stop and listen to the insight. I think you've got a such a unique perspective uh, that it needs to be heard. So thanks for your time today. Uh, appreciate you being with us. Thanks for having me. All right, Dr. David Klinger, uh, check him out uh, and his book, Into the Kill Zone. I highly recommend it. Like I said, I can't recommend that book enough for someone, uh, and the way it's laid out is really crisp and really clear. It's a fantastic read. Uh, to follow us on Twitter, at The Squad Room is our handle. Well, same for uh, Instagram. That's probably where I'm a little bit more active. I have a little bit more uh, success in contacting and reaching out to people. If you have a comment, question, uh, topic you think we're missing, hit me up at garrett at the net. Let me know what you think. Let me know what uh, what you think uh, you like, what you don't like. I, you know, I just want to hear. I want to hear what you think where, uh, and, and where you're at um, in your journey and what that journey entails. If you have a chance, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. Those reviews really help promote the show. They help us get the word out to other people. Uh, and they help us, um, they help potential listeners see that this is legitimate stuff that they probably need to learn about. So that would be great if you are on iTunes to leave a review. If you're on Stitcher, it'd be great if you could leave a review. Uh, we super appreciate it. Sign up for the mailing list at the squadroom.net. That's where the show notes are for this show and for every other show that we have. Uh, and, uh, you can find, uh, some, some stuff there, some more information, more information on me and other guests. All right. As always, the way I close at every show, please take care of each other and stay safe. <laughs>